And he's going to give us a word. Amen. Sure. The uh, children are going with Anne this morning, so if they'd like to uh, follow Anne through the door. I'm, I'm going to avoid saying the magical door because that, that brings up all sorts of connotations of things that we don't want in church. Um, and I've, I've been guilty of doing that before, so I won't do that again. <laughs> I've used, I've used all sorts of terms to describe that door over the years, including magical, mystical. It's, it's not, it's just a door, I promise. Um, but the, the, the things that they do are wonderful in there. Um, but, uh, yeah. You know, when, um, I, I, most of you would know that I've grown up sort of in church all my life. Uh, my parents pastored for a few years when I was very young and then uh, I've seen my mom and dad minister and speak in different churches over the years. And my mom used to have a tendency, she would stand on the stage and I would say 50% of the time, I might be doing her an injustice, but 50% of the time she would stand up at the start and she would just look out and she would just stand there and look. And she would normally make a joke about the fact that she just hadn't got anything to say, so she was just trying to figure out what she was going to say. And to be honest, growing up, I, I, I used to think that was the case, was that she just she hadn't figured out what she was going to speak on, and to, that she was just standing there looking for some sort of inspiration of something to, uh, to say. But actually, as I've had the opportunity to stand at the front and, and share and, and grow and sort of in that, and having seen the amount of preparation that my mom does put into messages that she, she speaks... One of the things I've realised is actually she just stands and waits for the Spirit. And that she just looks out and sees where the Spirit's moving and what the Spirit's doing. And I really felt compelled this morning just to stand and look at you guys. And I promise I won't start crying at you or anything like that. But it's just, it's so interesting just to stand and look sometimes. I think so often we take the opportunity just to to carry on and, and crack on and just do, do whatever needs to be done and get on with it and, and then go. But actually, how often do we just stand and look? How often do we just stand and watch and see what God's going to do? How often do we stand and wait for what God's about to say? Or instead, do we just move forward and carry on with the things that, he's gonna, that we think we should be doing? But actually, God's got something more, something different, something that we never planned because God does that. God's really, really good at just sort of doing stuff that we never planned on doing. And he loves to use us to do it. And one of the things I remember when my mum used to stand and look was you would get these awful, awkward sort of little chuckles of nervousness that would pass around the room as people wondered what's going to happen. And then she would normally carry on and, and start speaking. Or she might share something that, uh, that God had shared with her. I'm talking about her as if she was dead. She's really not. She's coming next week. Um, <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'm not breaking the news to you this morning or anything, Dawn. <laughs> uh, it's not a trip down memory lane. It's just having grown up in that sort of uh, environment. It's something that quite often you forget. You move past You move past what the Spirit's doing sometimes. And I think sometimes you, you get into a format of this is how things should be done, this is how things are supposed to be, and so you just rattle on and carry on. And so I think as I stand here this morning, the first thing that I'm going to do is apologise to you guys. I feel like over the last few months I've made quite a few apologies, um, and I feel like over the next few months I will continue to make apologies because I will continue to make mistakes. But mistakes are part of learning, mistakes are part of growing, and if any of you aren't making mistakes, feel free to come and take the stage from me. Um, <laughs> at any point, you're more than welcome to come up. But the apology I would make this morning is that over the last few weeks, Sundays have felt like just another day where we just get together and just get it over and done with. It's an hour and a half between half ten and twelve. Get it done and then I can go and get a cup of coffee and, uh, and chat to a few people and then sit down and relax. And one of the things that I was really pulled up um, meeting with a couple of people this week was that actually, where's the expectancy when we come to church? Do we actually expect anything from God? Do we expect things to happen? Do we expect things to change and things to move? Or do we turn up and just think, well, we're going to hear some music, we're going to hear someone speak, and then we're going to get a cup of coffee and a chat and go home. And I've got to be honest, that's kind of the mentality that I'd slipped into, was just the, the routine, getting things done, getting things over with, and then going home, and it's an awful position to be in, especially as the pastor of the church. And so that is my apology to you this morning, is that I've spent time 
over the last few weeks just wanting to move on with it. And it's not that I didn't want to be here, it's just that I had no expectancy. And I really got pulled upon that this week, that there's, there should be an expectancy in everything that we do when we meet with God. Why would we meet if we weren't expecting God to do something? Why would we get together if we weren't expecting God to speak to each one of us individually? Why would we get together if we weren't expecting God to do miraculous things that we've not seen him do before? Because if the only reason we're getting together is to have a nice chat and to see people we like, we can do that in the pub. Now that doesn't mean that we can't have church in the pub and that might be a nice idea. (laughs) But what it does mean is actually, are you turning up expectant? Maybe it's something I should have shared at the start of the service, but I'm sharing it now because I feel like this is what God's called me to do. And it's that idea of standing and waiting and expecting something from God. And, you know, I keep standing and waiting, and I'm I'm kind of talking a little bit because I don't know what God's going to say, but Ian, you've been on my heart for about 10 minutes now, and I don't know why. But as the worship was finishing... I could picture you behind me. I knew roughly where you were sitting, so I could picture you behind me. And I didn't know quite what God was going to say. And and God normally speaks to me more through a picture of someone or a picture of something rather than specifically hearing his voice. Um, And I would imagine that's the same for quite a lot of us, that we don't actually hear directly words. Some people have that wonderful gift that they hear crystal clear as if someone's speaking next to them. I don't get that. I just get a feeling. Um... And the feeling I got was a really, really weird feeling. I pictured your glasses and your beard. I don't know why. <laughs> and it's a, it's a strange, strange thing to sort of picture. But I stood up on the stage. And I saw you this morning. And you were nicely trimmed. You'd trimmed your beard and you'd, you'd shaven and you'd come in quite nicely. I felt like God was saying that there are things in the past that are like a ragged beard that they grow out of control, that they look messy. But actually underneath there's something great. Underneath there's something refined. And so God is going to strip back, tidy up and neaten up the things that feel out of a line to bring out something refined, something well defined and something that will bring glory to the thing that it is. So your beard brings glory to your face. It's kind of... Yeah, you can take that. There you go, Laura. If ever you say you don't like his beard, you can turn around and say, Pastor Michael says your beard brings glory to your face. But it's this idea of it shines the glory. It glorifies, it accents a feature in the same way that glasses accent a feature. And I feel like God's saying that he will tidy up the messes and accent his love through the messes that have been in your life. That you will walk forward in the calling that he has, knowing that it's along that path that it's, it's tidy it's not a mess but it's walking in that path maybe it makes sense maybe it doesn't if not I've just pictured your beard and glasses and you can have a laugh about that and if nothing else you've got an excuse now to keep a beard for the rest of your life um, but it's taking these opportunities where we actually we expect God to say something when we meet we expect God to speak to us when we get together and it doesn't just have to be me stood up the front like Sam said if you have a word from God share it every single person hears from God in their own unique way as I said for me it's just a feeling I get it's just a sense of something pops into my brain and I think well I might as well share it if I'm wrong I'm wrong it's the same with every single one of us we get this sense of it could just be something but I'm going to share it anyway it could be nothing If it's nothing, no harm, no foul is kind of the way they say it, isn't it? I don't think I've done Ian any harm in sort of talking about his beard for five minutes. But if it is something, that could change the walk of someone's life for the rest of their life. You can hold the key to someone's breakthrough in the mouth and you don't share it. But what I believe is God doesn't leave anyone out in the lurch so if you don't share it someone else will come up and speak that word to them but you miss the opportunity to share what God has placed on your heart you miss the opportunity to grow in the calling and the path that God has for you that each one of us have an opportunity to grow and stretch and expand ourselves to work with the Holy Spirit but if we don't take that opportunity we become stagnant we stay still we don't move anywhere and over the next few months we're going to be talking about 10 culture codes of Victory Church. 
Culture codes are something that define the way we work together with one another. They quite often say that culture is either, is either created by design or by default. You can either allow it to develop naturally or you can create the culture that you want. I believe there is a church we should create a culture that we want. And so over the next few months we're going to look at ten culture codes that create the environment in which we want to see the church operating. In which each of us should work with one another. Culture is about the expression of what's inside of us being expressed outwardly. And so the culture of the church is what's on the inside of the church being expressed outwardly in the way that we do things, in the way that we talk to one another, in the way that we act towards one another. We should develop a culture where we expect God to move, where we expect things to be shared by his spirit. But the first culture code that we've got, and it should come up on the screen, is this. It says that we lead with vision. This is our first culture code. This is a code for how we should all operate. It's not just about the leadership at the front of the church, but it's about every single person should operate leading their life with vision. As I said, if you don't step out in what the Spirit's calling you to, you can become stagnant, you become still. There is no movement, there's no moving forward and to lead with vision requires movement, we have to step out and move forward, you can't lead someone if you're not going anywhere it's, it's impossible to, to lead someone while standing still it requires movement and I always think about a vision vision's always a weird one that I've found interesting to try and explain and describe and, and sometimes interesting to try and grasp a hold of because as a church we have our vision which is to reach, to teach and to mobilise that's our vision as a church but how does that work for us as an individual how does that work for us as a church how does that work for us as a movement how does that actually play out in our day to day lives and so we lay out ideas of how we can do that but actually I would say that there's three different areas in which we lead Firstly, we lead ourselves. Secondly, we lead our family and the people around us. And then thirdly, we lead the church. And you might say, well, I'm not in a position of leadership in the church. I'm not part of a family. I'm on my own. Then you start with yourself. You learn how to lead yourself. You learn how to say, okay, God, where are you calling me to? What are you calling me to? And how do I get myself in line with that plan that you have for me? Vision is about seeing the step ahead of what everybody else sees. Vision is about seeing further than the people around you see. So you first of all have to see what God is calling for your life and be able to step into that. Vision for your own life is about saying, God, where are you calling me to? And then being willing to walk in that path. I quite often equate it to... Um, a trip that we took up Ben Nevis uh, a few years back. Uh, me and my mom and dad and sister did a walk up Ben Nevis and we decided that we were going to go up there. But as you're going up, um, it was a pretty naff day because it's Scotland and 363 of the days in Scotland are pretty naff. Um, you might get two nice days occasionally um, spread out throughout the year. Um, <laughs> once in June and once in July I think and that's, that's about it um, but it, it was a pretty naff day it had been raining all morning so we were unsure whether we were going to be able to do it because we were running out of time and the, the rain sort of broke by about 12 o'clock so we thought you know what we're going to do it and as we headed up it was glorious and sunny for part of the way up for about two thirds of the way up it was glorious and sunny um, it was warm it was totally unlike Scotland and then the last third you hit the cloud cover and it was much much more like Scotland you couldn't see anything in front of you. You couldn't see the direction with which you were walking. You couldn't see the path that was in front of you. You could see maybe a step ahead. But the person that was leading us on that trip was my dad. The reason my dad was leading us was firstly he had experience in walking up mountains and mountain climbing. He'd been doing it for years and years and years. He had experience in Ben Nevis. He'd been up Ben Nevis before. And he had the equipment that was needed to guide us. He'd got a map and he got a compass and he knew that he could guide us between the cairns so even though we couldn't see where we were walking we, could, we knew that about 50 yards to our left there was a 2,000 foot drop we knew off to our right there was just nothingness but we couldn't see exactly where we were moving forward but we knew that my dad had a map he had a compass and he knew where he was heading the, the final destination he knew the point that he was heading towards and so we would follow him but for each of us, we have to be able to do the same thing. We have to be able to find our map. And that starts 
in there. Your map will always start in the Word. I love the fact that God uses physical representations to represent a spiritual sort of thing. The fact that we look for a spiritual guidance, a spiritual map, that it comes out on paper in the Word. It's just like a, a normal map that we would unfold. You can unfold the pages and find the map for your life. But it comes with a compass, and that compass is the Holy Spirit. You see, a map without a compass is somewhat useless because you need to know what direction you're heading in when you start to walk. It's all well and good having a map, but if you don't know what direction you're facing in the first place, you're not going to get very far. You could end up walking off that 2,000-foot drop. But actually, to have the equipment that you need, to have the things that God's called you to, to walk with... You, you read the word, but the Holy Spirit interprets it for you, sets it in your heart and gives you the direction. One of the things that Dr. George spoke about while he was over in September is that our vision is like our magnetic north. It always pulls the compass true. And so even when the cloud cover comes and we can't see the next step in front of us, our vision, our purpose for our life should pull us forward in the direction that we're heading. Like Sam said, that picture on the front of that book that it's, sometimes it feels like everything around us is breaking every single strand of everything that we're holding on to is falling to pieces but one thing remains there's always one strand that holds on and that's Christ Christ pulls us forward in that vision that we're called to Christ pulls us forward holds us, ties us in and so we know that we can point to that magnetic north which is our vision if we move forward in those things to say if we're going to lead people we have to be able to lead ourselves first we have to become disciplined in the way that we do things you can't just decide that I'm going to take a trip up Ben Nevis but not be disciplined in the way that you do it if you just think well I'm just going to go for a stroll in my shorts and sandals <laughs> it's an unwise way to sort of tackle Ben Nevis I can, I can promise you that <coughs> flip flops is not the way to go up Ben Nevis T-shirt and shorts is not the way to go up Ben Nevis because no matter what happens when you get to the top, it's going to be cold. It's Scotland and it's 4,000 feet up in the air. It's always going to be cold. Uh, we have to know, firstly, the right equipment to have. And secondly, we have to have the discipline, not only to use the equipment, but to discipline ourselves to move forward. With the vision that God gives us, we have to be disciplined in executing that. We have to have an element of self-discipline to say, you know what, I'm going to stick to the calling that God's placed on my life. I'm going to push past the feeling of I don't want to do this or the feeling of this is too hard into knowing that God's called us to something more. Because when we can learn how to lead ourselves, when we can become disciplined in leading ourselves, then we can start to lead our family and the people around us. We can start to have influence over the people around us. John Maxwell says that leadership is influence. So firstly, we have to be able to influence ourselves. Then we influence the people directly around us. Then from there, we can begin to influence the church around us as well and the community in which the church is a part of. And as I said, you might turn around and say, well, I'm not part of the leadership of the church. What element do I play in leading the church forward? But actually, every single person has influence over someone in this room. You will look around and see someone who looks to you for wisdom, someone who looks to you for guidance, someone who looks to you as nothing more than an example. But you can be the very best example that you can possibly be just by firstly disciplining yourself and learning how to walk in the plan that God has for you. Secondly, by learning how to walk in the plan that God has for the family around you and the people closest to you. And then you can begin to influence the people further abroad from that. You can start to influence the people that are wider set. As I said, when um, I was going up Ben Nevis, we started off... And I've got to be honest, I didn't go with the right equipment. I went in jeans and a leather jacket. Um, I took 12 donuts with me. Um, that, was, that was my sustenance to get up and down Ben Nevis. I would like to point out that I ate 10 of the 12 donuts uh, because everybody knows if you're going on an expedition, you need calories to keep yourself going, and donuts are the best way to get calories, in my opinion. Um, so I had these 10 donuts, um, I had a leather jacket and jeans, and I started off in a pair of steel toe cap work boots. Oh. Mm. <laughs> now that might sound stupid. It was. Um, the reason I started in a pair of steel toe cap work boots was because I didn't have walking boots. 
Most people would go up a mountain with walking boots. I didn't own a pair. So I got to the mountain in trainers, much like the ones I'm wearing now. Here, yeah, just to start those for you. If anyone didn't know what trainers were, they look something like that. I would show for the back row, but my legs don't go any higher than that. So. Um, but I started off, I got to the bottom of the mountain in trainers and then put these work boots on because they looked the most like walking boots. They looked kind of like a walking boot. Uh, they had ankle support in case I trod on something that was uh, uncomfortable. They were waterproof in case I trod on anything wet. Um, they seemed like the right thing. What I realised after about half an hour was these were definitely not the right thing. They were very, very uncomfortable. They started to rub the back of my feet. And so I had a choice at this point. I could either choose to carry on with the walking boots and probably not make it. In fact, I can guarantee I would not have made it in, walk, in, uh, in work boots. Or I could change back into my trainers, which weren't the perfect footwear for going up Ben Nevis either. I can guarantee you the trainers aren't the ideal thing to walk up a mountain in either. So I was left with a choice here of, well, what do I actually do? Do I pick something that I've started with because it seems like it would be all right and it looks all right? Or do I pick something that would be more comfortable and easier, but still not the perfect fit? And quite often we face choices in life where we have a similar thing. There seems no perfect answer. It seems like whichever option we take, something's going to be wrong. There's something wrong with it. And if we're going to lead, if we're going to step forward in the vision that God's called us to, we've got to be willing to take the best option, not the perfect option. There's a, a, a rule in business called the 40-70 rule, which says that if something is between 40 and 70% sure it'll work, take it. If it's less than 40% sure, don't do it. And don't try and get it more than 70% because you'll be there forever trying to get it to work. But it's this idea of finding something that's just about right, that we think will work, and taking the best option of the two rather than the perfect option. You see, it caused pain to wear the steel toe cap boots. And to be honest, it put blisters on the back of my feet so that even when I changed into my trainers, I was still in a bit of pain because I got the blisters there from before. And so I had a choice at that point, half an hour into an eight hour walk, I think it was, whether I carried on or gave up. Many, many people will stop because pain is too much and they give up, rather than deciding to take a better option and work through the bit of pain that they have there to deal with the situation. That book that Sam showed you earlier on was a book called Leadership Pain. Um, it's a fabulous book. I would recommend it to anyone. Um, it opens your eyes up to reality, I think is probably the best way to put it, that it's not just about hairy-fairy sort of Christian life is wonderful. Um, but actually, that there is pain involved in Christianity. Uh, there is pain involved in walking the life that God's called us to. And each one of us will hit a moment where we have this sense of, do we step through the pain or do we stop? It was really interesting. I was in the prayer meeting this morning. I'm sure Peggy had read my notes. Um, I would say that, but I don't write notes. So uh, <laughs> you could have read my notes if I'd got any. Um, you, you must have read my mind instead. Um, but you prayed a prayer that said, Something along the lines of basically, we know that God doesn't lead us around the situations, he leads us through the situations. A lot of us will face problems, face situations that become hard, where we experience pain and we want God to take us around them rather than through them. The only way that we can learn and grow is to go through those, to embrace the pain of that situation and step through it. There's a verse that we know quite well that says, without vision the people perish. The way I would put that is perish I would describe as a numbness to the point of death. Without vision people become numb to the point of death. Numbness is the avoidance of pain. It's the, it's the not sensing any pain, not feeling anything. And so without vision, without a direction, we can get to a point where we think this is becoming too painful for me to, for me to step through it and we stop. We would rather be numb to the pain rather than embrace it and work through it. And so we lose any sight of vision, we lose any sight of focus, we lose all momentum, because we're not willing to work through the pain, we're only willing to walk to the pain. Without vision, we become numb to the point of death. In that leadership pain book, there's a story about a girl who... When she was born, she had no sense of pain. Her nerve endings didn't work properly. And so 
At 18 months old, um, she was uh, constantly dislocating her shoulder. She was covered in cuts and bruises. Uh, she bit through her tongue the once and her mouth was filled with blood and all this. And her parents were absolutely distraught. The father had left the mother because he couldn't cope with dealing with this daughter because she felt no pain. So she would end up in situations far, far worse than any child would normally end up in because she felt no pain. She was numb to the pain. Pain warns us of things. Pain tells us of things coming up and, and guides us so that we can be aware of situations. But actually, sometimes we have to learn how to be tolerant of the pain that we're experiencing in order to grow. There's a story of a guy called Craig Groeschel. Um, Craig Groeschel started Life Church. Uh, it's a big church. He started in 1996. It's in America. And uh, they spread across 10 states now. And uh, massive, massive church. But back in 1996, when they first started, he was 28 years old, uh, pastoring his first church for the first time. Um, started it with a few people, and they got to about 100 people. And as they got to about 100 people, they started up a connect group, um, started some different groups, up small groups. And one of his best friends took over a group. And within a few months, um, he was getting complaints about the group that the, the guy was teaching things that he didn't agree with. And so Craig Rochelle went to his friend and said, look, you're going to have to stop teaching this stuff. It doesn't line up with our theology. You're going to have to change it. And the guy kept teaching the same stuff anyway. And so he came, Craig came back to the guy and said, look, you're going to have to stop teaching this stuff. And he said, the, the guy turned around to him and said, look, I will just take the 30 people I've got in my group and go and start my own church. So a year into their church, Craig Rochelle experienced a church split. Um, a load of people left, some people stayed, uh, loads of people got sort of caught in the crossfire. And he remembered back to the time when he just started pastoring, and his mentor turned to him um, and said, I can promise you one thing as you step into pastoring. And Craig Gershell at this point thought, oh, it's going to be something amazing. That to, he's going to promise me that God says he will bless me more than I could ever imagine, or God will prosper my ways more than I could ever think. And his mentor turned around to him and said, I can promise you one thing, that God will break you. And a year later, Craig Rochelle is going through all these situations. And he says, he, he recalls a time where he went to his mentor after, after this period. And his mentor was, he said, one of the, one of the godliest men he knew, really full of, of the spirit of God, but struggled with past um, things holding on to him, struggled with depression. And the one night Craig and his mentor got into a, dis a disagreement over an issue, Craig had approached him and said, you've got to change something in your life, and he wasn't willing to do that. And they went away, and uh, his mentor was basically fuming. He, he said all sorts of things that he probably wished he hadn't said, left the room, uh, stormed out, and Craig thought, well, you know what, we'll leave it for a bit, and we'll probably have a chance to, to sort it out afterwards. Three days later, Craig got a phone call from his mentor's wife. Uh, she was absolutely distraught. She'd walked into the garage and found that he'd hung himself in the garage. And Craig Rochelle talks about this time afterwards where he says, the words that his mentor had said to him, that God will break you, resonated so true. And then he sat in a conference where a guy called Samuel Chand was talking. And one of the words that Samuel Chand said was that you will only ever grow to the level of your pain threshold. If you are unable to grow past the pain and work through the pain, you will never grow beyond that situation. You will never be able to move past that situation. In the same way when I stood on Ben Nevis and I had this choice about whether I changed my footwear or carried on in uncomfortable things, I knew that I had to change. It wasn't the best situation, but I had to change into the trainers because they were better than the thing I was in. I had a choice to make there and then. But I also had the choice of whether I just went back and sat in the car and waited for them to finish it, or whether I pressed on through the pain, worked through it, and carried on to the top. I can say thankfully that I made it to the top. I pushed through the pain. I got to see the top of Ben Nevis. Couldn't see a thing. It was absolutely white over. It was hailing. Couldn't see anything. But I stood on the top of Ben Nevis. But I wouldn't have got there if I wasn't willing to press through the pain, if I wasn't willing to raise the level of my pain threshold and say, you know what, I'm not going to turn back, but I'm going to keep walking, knowing that God will lead me through this situation, not around the situation. 
each one of us will face a moment where we have that choice of how do we get from the situation we're in now to where God wants us to be. Are we willing to push through it, knowing that it will be painful, that there will be times where God will break us to the point where we feel like there's nothing left and the only thing that holds us there is that one strand, which is Christ. The reason God breaks us is not because he wants to see us hurting, not because he wants to see us broken, but because he wants us to be fully focused and fully dependent on him. If the only thing that holds us to Christ is, or the only thing that holds us to God is Christ, then we can truly be used in the way that God wants us to be. It strips back all the other things, all the other rubbish that we try and hold on to ourselves. God gets rid of that. God grows us through the situation, raises our pain threshold so that next time we face that situation, we know that we've grown beyond where we were before. The interesting thing I find is that Jesus kind of went through the same thing in the Garden of Gethsemane, you hear Jesus pray, Father, if it's possible, take this cup away from me. But not my will, but your will be done. This is my interpretation of what Jesus said there. Basically what he said is, God, this hurts. This really hurts, and I know it's going to hurt more. And if there was any way I could avoid it, I wish I could. But ultimately, I know if you're calling me through it, I'll walk with you through it, and I'll grow through it. Each one of us will probably face a moment like that where we say, God, this really hurts and I wish I could get around it. But actually, God, if you're there with me, I know that I can get through it. I'm willing to raise the level of my pain threshold. I'm willing to stick at something, to push forward to the vision that you've called me to, knowing that I will grow in myself once I've done that. Knowing that when I look back, the experience won't have been pleasant. The thing that I went through won't be something I would ever want to go through again but I'll be thankful for the place that you've brought me to because of that thing. I don't ever think that God wants to see us go through pain. I don't ever think that God wants to see us hurt. But I do think that God wants to see us grow. And so many of us will stop at a point where we can't make that choice to take the better of the two options. We wait for the perfect option. We hope for no pain rather than being willing to grow our pain threshold. And in the hoping for no pain, we sit there in a numb state to the point where we perish. If we're going to lead ourselves, if we're going to lead our family, if we're going to lead our church in the vision that God's called us to, we have to take the focus off us. We have to take the focus off, I don't think I can do this, or I don't think I can put up with this. I don't really want to experience that pain, so I'm just going to sit there. And we have to put the focus on what God's calling us to. You know, one of the things I noticed when I was going up Ben Nevis was that my dad was leading us up Ben Nevis. Never once did I hear him complain. Never once did I hear about any pains that he was going through. Never once did I hear him say that he didn't know what he was supposed to be doing. But he faithfully led us up Ben Nevis and back down again as well. Uh, That was really nice of him that he didn't just leave us at the top. Um, But he brought us back as well. When your focus changes from yourself to the people around you, when you stop complaining about the things that are going on in your life, when you stop complaining about all the problems that you face or why church isn't doing the things that you think it should be doing for you, but actually you realise that you're called to lead someone around you, that actually you become an example for them and you say, you know what, I'm going to walk the way God's called me to walk, regardless of the pain I'm experiencing, knowing that I will grow through this, knowing that I will grow and raise my pain threshold to the point where I can say, I've come through it, I've survived it, and I'm now greater than I am, than I was before. There were four things that Craig Grishel said that he learned from those early experiences, and particularly with uh, losing his mentor. The first thing he said that he learned was that any situation that you avoid will ultimately get worse the longer you leave it. If you don't deal with something straight away, it will only ever get worse. And so experience a little bit of pain now and deal with the situation rather than allowing a situation to develop and get worse to the point where it becomes impossible to deal with. Don't allow the fear of a little bit of pain to stop you from pressing through 
and growing through that situation and dealing with the situation that comes up. The second thing he said he learned is that pain is part of progress. That if we're going to grow, we have to experience some element of pain. Everything that grows experiences some element of pain. We call it growing pains. That actually the only time we don't feel pain is when we're sitting stagnant. The third thing that he said is that the thing that stands between where I am now and where God wants me to be is my pain threshold. Am I willing to stretch my pain threshold so that I can get from where I am now and grow into the thing that God wants me to be, into the place where God wants me to be? And there's a fourth thing that I can't remember, so I'm going to look it up. <laughs> I knew I'd do that. That was it. It's the most important one. It's always the most important one that you forget. The fourth thing was this. The thing that he learned most of all was that God is always faithful. That God doesn't take us through a situation and leave us there. But God sees us through the situation to the very end. God is faithful. If there are three words that you take away from today, take those three words. God is faithful. God is faithful. In every situation, God is faithful. But our focus has to change from us to the people around us. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 12. You know when you sort of wrestle with yourself and think, I don't know whether I should say that, or I don't know whether I should do that. I certainly do that pretty much every Sunday that I stand up here, um, is I wrestle with myself and say, I don't know whether I should say that, or whether that's what I should really be doing. Um, And I've got to be honest, this, this passage from Matthew chapter 12 has been with me all week as I've been preparing for this message. And it's never seemed to quite fit. Um... You can sometimes try and shoehorn things into a message and sort of cram them in one way or another. It's like, yeah, that'll, if I squeeze it around and manipulate it this way, that verse will fit. Um, but it doesn't seem to quite fit with what I've said so far. So let's call this a subparagraph to the message that, to, that I'm preaching this morning. I think that God will fit it in as we go. Um, we're going to read from verse 22, I think. Yeah. Verse 22 in Matthew chapter 12. It says this, Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand if Satan casts out Satan how is he is divided against himself how then will his kingdom stand and if I cast out demons by Beelzebub by whom do you do your sons cast them out therefore they shall be your judges but if I cast out demons by the spirit of God surely the kingdom of God has come upon you Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? He who is not with me is against me and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruits good, or else make the tree bad and its fruits bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. 
for by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. Quite often we read this passage where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And I think we, we read it as another one of those righteous anger moments from Jesus where he's giving the Pharisees sort of a good telling off. But I think I see it a little bit differently. I think I read this passage and I see the pain that Jesus was going through. I see it as a moment where he's talking to people who just don't seem to get the importance of the message that he was sharing. He sees people who are more interested in fighting among themselves rather than in building the kingdom of God. I look at this passage and at the very start it says that a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. In the same way a church divided against itself cannot grow. A church which is self-focused will focus on their own problems, will focus on making sure that they experience as little pain as possible and will ultimately be divided against itself. If we're going to move forward in the vision and the purpose that God has for us as a church, our focus has to change from backbiting, from bickering, from falling out with one another over stupid little things to saying, okay, what is God calling you to do? And how can I help you do that? I think that's one of the greatest questions that anyone in church can ask. Is what is God calling you to do and how can I help? Because it takes all of the focus off me and it puts the focus on you and says I want to see your giftings grow. I don't want the spotlight to be on me. I don't want the spotlight to be on my problems and my situation and how you can make my situation better. But actually I want my focus in life to be on how I can help you. If we're called to move in the plan that God has for our life, our focus has to change from how can I help me to how can I help you. We have to be willing to raise our pain threshold to step into the thing that God's calling us to, knowing that we can't avoid pain, but through those situations of pain, through those difficult situations that we feel like we can't possibly get through, but we know that God holds us and draws us through, that at the end of it we will have grown, We will have seen ourselves go through things and come out the other side stronger and better. And that we will see a church that is moving forward in the things that God has called them to. We're called to lead with vision. It means that we have to know this is the step that God is calling me to and I'm going to walk on it. This is the step that God is calling this church to and we will walk on it. It's knowing where God is calling us to and saying we will work together, not against one another to do that. It's saying that regardless of the pain that we might experience, that we know that if Christ holds us together, if Christ is that one bond that keeps us connected to God, that we will come through it at the end. So my question to you guys this morning Where do you set your pain threshold? Do you seek to avoid as much pain as possible and sit in that place of numbness where ultimately you become numb to the point of death? And my challenge to you this morning Change the focus of your life. Do not look to how you can help you, but look to how you can help someone else. Let every question that comes out of your mouth be how can I help you in the calling that God has for your life. I've spent the last few months saying God has a plan for every single person in this room. God has something that each and every person in this room is specifically designed to do by him for his kingdom. And I still believe that. 
I still believe that every single person has a plan and a purpose from God. But it's up to us to be willing to lead the people around us. It's up to us to be willing to draw out those things from those who are next to us and say, how can I help you in the calling that God has on your life? Yes. Um, when we were worshipping earlier, I had a picture of um, the water, a great vast sea, and um, it was pure water. It wasn't salty, it wasn't, it was just pure. And the spirit, of the, the Holy Spirit was like a dove hovering over the water, and I felt God say that that water is us. As a drop, one drop of water is no good. A couple of drops of water is no good. But a vast sea can make a change. That water can sweep through the land. It can make such a change. But only when it's fueled by the Holy Spirit. And I really agree with what you're saying today. I just want to confirm that. That the Holy Spirit will fuel us. Will lead us in vision. Will sweep through. We can be a mighty ocean bringing about change. When we stand together. Mm, thank you. Mm. I'm going to finish the message the same way I started it. I'm going to look. But this time, rather than looking and seeing, okay, God, what do you want to do? I'm going to look with different eyes. And I encourage you guys to look the same. The eyes that I will look this time. Okay, God. What are you calling them to do? Look at one another and say, okay, God. What are you calling them to do? What are you calling them to do? Each one of you has a plan and a purpose that God has placed on your life. And it's up to every single person around them to help to draw that out, to help to develop that, to help them grow into the place that God wants them to be. There are some things that only you as an individual can do, but there are things that we as a body can do to help the people around us as well. You know, as I look around the room, I see many, many people who at some point in their life have gone through a situation and have held those three words. God is faithful. There are people in this room who have gone through situations that you're facing at the moment and have been able to walk through it and say, God is faithful. There are people in this room who can help you through a situation that you're going through because they have gone through it themselves and been able to say, God is faithful. But unless we're willing to share with one another what God has done for us, we'll never know. You can hold the key to someone else's breakthrough in the words that you have inside of you. But unless you're willing to share with those people around you unless you're willing to listen to what the Holy Spirit is leading you to and step out in that risk it all for the sake of what God's calling you to you'll never know how much you can help that person you'll never know how much that person can grow but it all stems from a point where we can stand there and say God is faithful in every situation we face that should be the three words that resonate constantly is God is faithful. No matter what problem, no matter what circumstances, no matter what feelings we're going through, God is faithful. Mm. We're going to pray and then uh, I'm going to hand back over to Sam. Father, I thank you that we know that in all situations you are faithful.
Father, that in everything that we go through, we know that you lead us through it, Father God. And so, Father, I pray that we wouldn't be afraid of pain, but we would know that it's part of the process of growth, Father. We would know that in every situation we face, however painful it is, that you're there by our side. That you lead us forward, Father God. Father, I pray that we would learn how to lead ourselves, that we would learn how to lead our families, and that we would learn how to lead the church around us, the people around us. Father, that we would know what it means to follow your vision, your calling for our life. And Father, I pray we would learn how to draw out the vision for other people's lives, to draw out the calling on other people's lives, Father God. That in everything that we do, that we would sense your Holy Spirit leading us, Father. Father, your Spirit would just point us in the right direction, that your Spirit would fix our eyes in the right direction, that we would see the people around us. We would see the people hurting, we would see the people broken we would see the people with situations and problems that they're facing and we would know how we can be that light to them Father God that in whatever situation they're facing we can stand there and say God is faithful Hmm. thank you Father Amen thank you Sam Thank you, Michael. You know, um, when Michael...